Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. I am Christina Knowles, the National Museum of Women in the Arts Director of Development, Annual Giving and Membership. Thank you so much for joining us for this special tribute to celebrate and remember the legacy of our founder, Wilhelmina Cole Holiday, or Billy, as so many friends called her. It is heartwarming to see that most of you attending are charter members and supporters who have been with the National Museum of Women in the Arts since our very early days. Some since before we opened our doors at 1250 New York Avenue in 1987. This is a true testament to the power of Mrs. Holliday's vision and the enduring need for a space dedicated to recognizing the accomplishments of women in the arts. We are so grateful for your commitment then and now which has been essential to making Mrs. Holiday's vision a reality. For those of us on the staff, it is an honor to be a part of this great mission that our founder put in motion nearly 40 years ago. Please welcome NIMWA's director, Susan Fisher Sterling, who is hosting this tribute with Wynne and Holiday, vice chair of the board of trustees and Mrs. Holiday's daughter-in-law. Thank you so much, Susan and Winnen. Thank, Thank you. you, Christina. And Carolyn, may I have the first slide, please? Great. So it's, it's very good to be here with everyone. Carolyn, slide two. So with her passing, we know we've lost a visionary leader. Uh, together with Mrs. Mrs. Holliday, with her late husband, Wallace, began collecting art by women, as you know, in the 1970s, spurred on by the realization, of course, that historical and contemporary women artists were not being given their due. She had audacity, not just to build the collection, but actually to start uh, this museum, especially because she started it in her 60s. Mrs. Holliday had the vision to create a place of honor for women in the arts. She recognized a need and in her determined fashion, she achieved it with the support from a broad base of people from across the country and across the world. You are members are a big part of that story from the very beginning. Have the next. And to think that it all began with this modest still life by Flemish artist, Clara Paters. Many longtime friends and members of the museum know the story of the holidays visits to the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna and the Prado in Madrid, where the holidays saw a breakfast scene by Paters. Intrigued, they came home to the United States to try to find out something about this artist uh, in their art history books, whether it was Jansen's History of Art or Gardner's uh, Art History Through the Ages, but they found nothing about Paters. Uh, jokingly, Mr. Holliday said to Mrs. Holliday, perhaps it was because Clara Paters was a woman. And with that, they discovered actually that not only was Paters not in these books, but there were no women artists at all. This launched their collecting focus, along with some great advice from the renowned pop art collector, uh, Richard Brown Baker, who was a friend of theirs, who told Mrs. Holliday that having a focus on their collecting would make it more fun and more rewarding. Next slide. So though originally they had no intention of starting a museum, the holidays focus on great art by women yielded some amazing discoveries. Here's, here's an example of uh, Mary Louise Wood, our first director of education in Mrs. Holliday's house in Georgetown, showing a, a 1719 hand colored folio of works by the Dutch artist Maria Sibylla Marianne. You can see their natural history illustrations, their his, but their history illustration, illustrations of, uh, are of insects and flowers from Suriname. 
this woman went all the way to South America in the 18th century in hoop skirts uh, to do this work. Mrs. Holliday loved Marion's intrepidness. Next slide. And if there were all women in the slide before, it's all men now and Mrs. At, in, in this photo of Mrs. Holliday. Uh, she is, uh, even though she did not originally intend to create a museum, by the 1980s, the Holidays uh, came to the decision that this was something they wanted to do. And from their collection, as Mrs. Holliday euphemistically said, that collection became a seed from which the museum would grow. And so here's Mrs. Holliday with the Masons um, and the, signing the deed so that the former Masonic temple could become our home. And next slide. And of course, this is our home. Nimwa is still the only major museum in the world solely dedicated to recognizing the creative achievements of women past and present. And I believe that's one great reason why you all support us. Next slide. So look at this self-assured uh, pose. In the new galleries in 1987, uh, when Mrs. Holliday was being filmed at the opening of the inaugural exhibition called American Women Artists, 1750 to 1950. I remember seeing this show. I was a graduate student and was at the Hirshhorn Museum as a Smithsonian fellow. And I came to see the exhibition. I looked at all the works and I thought, hmm, that one comes from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And this one's from the Metropolitan. And that one's from the Musée d'Orsay. And that one's from the Cleveland Museum of Art. And then all of a sudden I realized, you know, I had never seen any of those works on the walls of those museums. And that's when the idea of working for a museum for women in the arts struck me as a really good idea. Next, please. So at the beginning, as you all know, there was controversy in the museum's early days. The need for a women's museum was questioned and criticized. Mrs. Holliday often spoke about how the feminists said, oh, this is some kind of white gloves establishment, as you see in the women's art news. Uh, we don't want any part of it. And then the old dowagers, as Mrs. Holliday would say, said, well, this is some kind of feminist establishment and we don't want any part of it. And the men, especially the male critics, just criticized the museum out of hand. It was printed, there were things printed everywhere. And as Mrs. Holliday said, that kind of controversy put us on the map. Next slide. Of course, there were feminist artists who supported the idea of a separate space for women artists. And here, uh, Mrs. Holliday is speaking with uh, Judy Chicago. The two could not have been more different, but they were united in the cause of bringing women artists uh, out of the darkness and into the light. Next slide. Mrs. Holliday had a force of personality for all of those who knew her that drew people into the project of forming and supporting this institution. She also had an exceptional ability to welcome and recognize all different kinds of people. She used to say all the time, People are endlessly fascinating. And given our location in Washington, two blocks from the White House, you can see she often invited the neighbors and their friends to visit. Notice especially Mrs. Holliday and Nelson Mandela. It has to do with the next slide, please. So among the most memorable vis visits was Mandela's who came to see his countrywoman, Endebele artist Esther Majlangu's mural. She painted it on the derelict building next door, which later became the Elizabeth A. Kasser wing. Um, the opening speaker was none other than Maya Angelou on one of two visits she made to the museum to speak. Next slide. 
So Mrs. Holliday and Mr. Holliday had a passion for rediscovering women artists of the past, offering up moments of exceptional achievement, beginning with 16th century uh, European artists. The historical works in the collection are the strength and the treasure trove of the Holliday donation, which now numbers over 600 works. Painters like the great Lavinia Fontana, the first professional woman artist of the Renaissance, whose talent was her dowry and whose fame in Bologna eventually led to an invitation to work in Rome uh, for Pope Clement the uh, Seventh. Judith Leister of Holland uh, during the Golden Age of Holland, a, a member of or the circle of Franz Hals. She was so, her work was so good that in the 19th century, an unscrupulous dealer covered up her signature and painted a Franz Hall signature on top of it in order that the, uh, her paintings could be, could be bought for more money. And it's interesting, part of the rediscovery of her work has been examining Franz Hall's signatures and finding that underneath there was often the L of Leicester plus the star. And then of course there's Vigée Lebrun, uh, one of Mrs. Holliday's favorite painters, the first woman to be accepted into the Académie des Beaux-Arts and court painter to Marie Antoinette. We have three impressive portraits by Lebrun, as well as a sketchbook from her Russian period uh, where she was welcomed uh, by Catherine the Great after or during the French Revolution. Next, please. One of the crowning achievements among our wealth of historical exhibitions was the brainchild of Mrs. Holliday and board member Kathy Springhorn. It was called an Imperial Collection, Women Artists from the State Hermitage Museum. And Mrs. Holliday loved to tell the story about how the Russian conservators showed us works by women artists in the basement and attic storage rooms. She talked about the pigeons in the attic. She talked about the fact that the paint was peeling off of the images and that we, Nimwa, restored these works for the Hermitage so that they could come to the museum for this exhibition. And the red room you see beside the image of the, the photograph of the holidays and a number of us, that actually is an, a room in the museum uh, with some of those uh, portraits. Um, she said when Dr. Piotrowski came to the museum, he said to her he could not believe that these were actually works from his collection. And she was most proud of the fact that when they were returned to Russia, many of them were hung on the walls of the Hermitage for the first time in a hundred years. Next slide. Mrs. Holliday was also fascinated by modern and contemporary art. In early 20th century figurative art, she loved Suzanne Valadon, whose work you see on the left. Uh, Valadon, who was a demi-mondaine, who was a, an, an artist model for folks like Renoir to Picasso, and who was overlooked as an artist for many years in favor of her son, Maurice Utrio. In the center, you have Frida Kahlo, who you'll hear more about from Win and Holiday in our Q&A. And then finally on the right, you have Sonia Delaunay, who brought a colorful brand of cubism uh, to, into fashion, design, textiles, and everyday life, which I think Mrs. Holiday truly appreciated. Uh, this is part of a sketch for a mural project that Delaunay began in uh, 1937. Uh, it's a remembrance of the couple's sojourn, she and her husband, Robert. Uh, they went to Portugal in 1915 uh, to flee Paris uh, during World War I. And so it's a remembrance of those uh, times. Next slide. In contemporary art, she was especially keen on sculpture and had a wonderful eye for talent including a Louise Bourgeois. You can see that beautiful Ursula von Reidingsvard, massive cedar sculpture created by a woman with a penchant for big power tools. 
That was something Mrs. Holliday always laughed about. And then of course, her good friend, she had a wonderful uh, relationship with Magdalena Abakanovich, whose seated figures are made from burlap uh, dipped in polymer resin. Next, please. So Mrs. Holliday uh, lived to see the museum flourish and celebrated many triumphs. And she really was able to see her revolutionary idea of a museum for women artists, val not only validated by the art world, but also celebrated. In the last 15 years of her life, she was as energetic and productive as ever. In 2015, for example, she realized a dream she had had held dear for met almost 30 years, an exhibition devoted to the image of the Virgin Mary in the history of Renaissance art. And here you see her with Monsignor Timothy Verdon on the inaugural tour of Picturing Mary, Woman Mother Idea. Among those paying rapt attention to Monsignor Verdon with her are behind her, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice um, Ginsburg. And also you see Andrea Cortese, that's Irene Natividad's husband. And Irene, I think you're in the audience tonight. And then behind that is Fra Filippo Lippi's exquisite mother and child painting. And alongside these great male painters like Lippi and Botticelli, the exhibition also introduced recently rediscovered women artists like Sister Ursula Caccia, whose works are in this beautiful blue room at the front of the galleries, and then also uh, Sister Platilinelli of Florence. Next, please. In 2013, Mrs. Holliday welcomed Faith Ringgold to the museum when we debuted Ringgold's early work in the exhibition, American People Black Light, and they became fast friends and mutual admirers. Mrs. Holliday really liked a face, sparkly Ugg boots, and they talked for some time about finding shoes that would fit right. Uh, the museum purchased its first major Ringgold after this exhibition. And for those of you who may be in the DC area and did not see this exhibition, now, 10 years later, you can see what Nimwa began by visiting the Ringgold retrospective at Glenstone, a new modern and contemporary museum here in DC. That exhibition is up now. Next. For her devotion to 18th century French, which was one of her favorite areas, she was awarded the Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur for service to the arts of France. And you here you can see the then French ambassador uh, awarding her her honor. Next. And here she is with a beautiful French painting, a quintessential portrait by impressionist Bert Morisot entitled Young Woman in Mauve which was donated to the museum by Austin philanthropists and devoted friends of the museum, Terry and Joe Long. Mrs. Holliday had hoped for some years that this work would come into the collection at some point. And in 2017, the Longs realized that dream of hers by giving the painting for the museum's 30th anniversary. And the closing slide. A life in art, a life well lived. Sorry. We miss Mrs. Holliday's leadership, energy, and unerring commitment to the museum. We all will honor her memory in many ways, foremost through our continued work together for the mission she truly believed was so important in the world, championing women in and through the arts. Well, y'all, I almost got through it. <laughs> um, so now um, it's good of women to join us. Um, there are some questions I would like to ask of her. Um, we tried to 
prepare some things that we think will be of interest to you. And then Christina, as I understand it, um, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience through the chat. Is that correct? Um, yes, if, if we have time, we can do that. Okay, well, hopefully we'll have a little time. So Winnan, thank you again for joining us. Um, originally, uh, your in-laws, the Holidays, knew that the focus for their collecting would be women artists. But as I said, Mrs. Holiday had no idea about creating a museum. I mean, what, what changed? How did she come up with the idea of a museum for women in the arts? So just before I answer that question, First of all, you got me choked up at the end, Susan. Uh, I just want, I, I, I thought I was going to be able to see everyone, but I have seen a list and I just want to thank all of you for attending this tribute. Um, we have really had an outpouring of condolences from all around the world, but of course, many, 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 and so many meaningful ones from you all. And so I just wanted you to know that on behalf of HAP and our children, uh, we have just been so, so touched and we really want to thank you all. Uh, it's going on, what, almost six o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. And it's, I think, a really appropriate time for us to gather here in Washington because it's about this time uh, every evening that Billy would be enjoying a glass of champagne, uh, which she did until just a couple of days before she passed away. Um, so this is a celebration of her life and um, I'm gonna raise a virtual glass um, to salute um, my mother-in-law, the founder of the museum, um, Billie Holiday, and most especially to thank you all for participating in this. So you asked me what, Susan, about the focus of their collection. Um, uh, Moving into a museum. Yeah, so I think many of you have heard this before, but really the first thing uh, is that their collection, which um, really uh, rapidly, uh, began to fill their Georgetown townhouse, outgrew the space. Uh, they really needed more wall space. So, you know, they had this passion of collecting, but uh, not the intentions of having a museum. And um, I think Billy would say, and Christina, you might, I think you were part of this um, program this evening, who helped so much uh, have Billy um, uh, create her museum of own her own book, but I know this is, was noted in the book that Billy really didn't remember a specific uh, like aha moment or time uh, when this concrete idea of the museum came. But she did remember, and I think as she referred to her as really the idea's godmother of who gave Billy this idea. And that was uh, Nancy Hanks. And Nancy Hanks was a really good friend of hers and an advisor. Nancy Hanks was chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts. And she was on the Board of Regents at the Smithsonian. She had visited the Holidays House many times and was intrigued by their reason to collect and would tell Billy that after her visits and learning about the collection, she would go to museums and immediately say, what women artists do you have here? And of course, you know, what that answer was. So, you know, with that, that started catapulting and really uh, I don't ever remember it being anything but just seamless and, um, you know, Billy went to work and the rest was history or the rest was her story, right? Right. Yeah. And what about Mr. Holiday? Can you tell us more about his role in collecting the art? What, what, what was the dynamic between them? And is there a personal story you could say that, tell us that talks about that? Mm, so many. Um, so, even before the holidays focused on the theme of works by women artists, they had a great interest in collecting. And I truly think that this collaboration, I know our children will say this, um, was one of the most beautiful aspects of their marriage. They loved to travel and they loved to collect. And in the beginning, it wasn't on a large scale and there was no specific medium or genre. 
they just received great joy with this shared interest uh, because really both Billy and Wally had a discerning eye. Um, so uh, just maybe sharing a, a, a little anecdote um, of Wally's, well, I mean, he was, they were, they were a twosome. And, you know, I actually catch myself sometimes saying the founder, because it really, as many of you know, really was the founders. Uh, he was behind her or with, her, beside her, sometimes behind her uh, every step of the way, because she did lead the way, but he loved it. Um, so when they, I think I, shared this anecdote with uh, Deb Carstens not too long ago, but when they started focusing on women artists, um, they collect their collection of course, then was in large scale and they were purchasing frequently. And Wally got special pleasure, always finding a piece to give to Billy at Christmas time. Uh, mind you, at this point, um, most often she had found the piece but he was buying the piece, okay? So, so many of the works were purchased through auction houses and the joy he had was not telling Billy whether he won or lost the purchase of that or uh, that during that auction, uh, uh, obtaining that, that, that work of art. And then he would often wait for months and months uh, and she would know, he wouldn't tell her. Uh, and then he would surprise her with that work of art. Christmas Eve was served at the Holiday House in Georgetown. Um, and um, Billy always sat at the end of the table with her back to the fireplace. I'm sure many of you have been in that R Street house. So. That evening, right before we were seated, Wally would take down whatever painting was hanging over the fireplace and replace it with the surprise work of art. So always Wally <clears throat> had the grandchildren, our children, um, who were very, very young at the time and at the table in on the secret. And they did what they could to make their grandmother turn around and notice that something was different and there was a new um, surprise piece of art. And this tradition um, went on for many years. And of course, Billy became very savvy to this, but she always played along. And I really don't know who got more enjoyment out of this tradition, um, the kids, uh, Billy, Wally, but I really think it was Wally. And it was very memorable for us. And um, all of those pieces are at the museum now. That's amazing, that is amazing. Um, how about you, Wynn, and what was your uh, involvement uh, in your in-laws collecting? I mean, you have a master's degree in art history and um, you uh, were involved with the family because I believe you married Hap when you were quite young. I moved from my college dorm to marrying Hap. I just turned 21. So I did have a BA in art history and I was starting to pursue my master's at GW. But it was, the holidays were just beginning the collecting of women artists. Uh, I don't know, I brought this because I'm actually at my husband's office, I'm not him. So I brought this to show you all. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, this is a three ring binder. The tabs uh, are alphabetical. And so I started cataloging their collection. And, um, you know, from, uh, I had a piece of paper for each work of art. And uh, they had, I had the, obviously the information, the background, the title, uh, the provenance, and uh, kept that in that binder. Uh, but on several occasions, uh, they would send me on buying trips. And it was always to New York and usually to Sotheby's auction house. Um, mind you, at that point, I was a little older. I was maybe in my late 20s, uh, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I had their checklist, and more importantly, I had their checkbook. And it was truly some of the most memorable times I had in my uh, young adult life. Uh, the, I was at Sotheby's auction house uh, one year 
I know the date. It's, it's in my little binder. Uh, it was uh, May 1980, actually. And um, they were auctioning uh, Rosa Bonheur's Sheep by the Sea. And I, you know, had my little placard and I had my limits, but, you know, every once in a while I'd say, okay, well, I'll just go up a little bit higher. And uh, I'll never forget that particular piece because at the end of the auction, and I will tell you this price, I, won't, I don't like talking numbers and a couple numbers I'm not going to mention later on, but that piece we got for $7,000. And I remember three very distinguished men coming over to me, three piece suits, kind of a white mustache and congratulating me on obtaining this and purchasing this and my bidding. And I'm just, you know, thank you very much. But yeah, that was, I was directed and um, it worked out. So that was fun. That's great. That's great. Um, so the, the Frida Kahlo is one of our most important works. And I know that was not part of the holiday donation, but I also know that Mrs. Holiday played an important role in that. Can you tell us how the uh, Kahlo came into the collection? Yeah, so um, she uh, did know Claire Booth Luce. Uh, Claire Booth Luce, as many of you knew, was a, a diplomat. She served as the ambassador, our ambassador to Italy. And I think the meeting, one dinner was at the Italian embassy. And she turned to Billy and said, I have something for you. And that actually happened a lot with Billy, as, as you know, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was one story she was traveling across the Midwest and she was scheduled to take a flight. And someone said, I have something for you. And Billy said, oh, that's so nice, but I'm, you know, have a flight to take. And then was that a, a Vigie Lebrun, Susan? Yes. Yeah. And, and so Billy said, well, I think I can change my traveling schedule. and. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. Um, so, so Claire Booth Luce invited Billy over uh, to her apartment uh, in, at the Watergate at the time. And uh, Billy describes that as soon as she really walked in the door, um, uh, Mrs. Luce said that she was ill, uh, that she only had a few months to live and that she um, you know, had this special piece for the museum. And as a matter of fact, I, the museum opened in April of 87 and Mrs. Luce died in October of that year. But the uh, Frida Kahlo uh, that we received um, uh, is the um, self-portrait as probably many of you know, uh, dedicated to Trotsky and um, I, I believe there are a couple of stories how Mrs. Luce got it, but what Mrs. Luce told Billy was that um, that she, Mrs. Luce was traveling in Mexico and was visiting Frida, and it was at the time that Frida got the um, news that Trotsky had been assassinated, and uh, Frida was very distraught and took a knife and was going to ruin it. And Claire Booth Lou said, please let me purchase it and we will, you know, carry this forward. And um, so that that's the story we've been told. And uh, it, uh, it, as you all know, is uh, really the only Frida in the larger Washington metropolitan area. Is that correct, Susan? Yeah, yes, the only one in a public collection. And for me, I think it's so amazing because it's the only painting where there's any, where Frida talks in any way about her involvement with, um, with the Communist Party. Mm. And I just find it somewhat ironic. And I wonder if Mrs. Luce thought of this as a statesperson, that it should be seated in the, the country, the, the center of our republic, republic our de democracy. Just an interesting thing. So, um, so Mrs. Holliday, um, what would you say was the last great artwork that Mrs. Holliday gave uh, to the museum? I know Susan, you know of her passion, but I think a lot of you probably would know this because Billy talked about the artist Louise Bourgeois all the time. And she really was passionate about this artist. 
and especially her series of spiders. And for years, she pursued purchasing uh, one of the bronze spiders. I think this was summer of 2018, Susan. I'm not sure, but Billy finally, it could, I don't think it was 19, I think it was 18. Billy finally found a bronze spider that she really loved at the auction house. And I will tell you this, and this is where I will not mention a number, but my <laughs> husband called me and he said, did you know that mother paid blank, 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 blank for a bronze spider? And of course, Hap did not know about Louise Bourgeois, even though she did talk about him, but he was a little taken back, but Billy was thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. And the spider was shipped to R Street, to, to the Georgetown house before it came to the museum. Uh, she had a, um, a, a Lucite um, table um, made to uh, put the spider on and the spider was in her bedroom for many months. Um, and she, it, it, was, it was truly uh, one of her favorite pieces of art. And it's especially special that, you know, she was able to do that at that time. Uh, I will tell you one other quick half holiday story. A few months after that, I was in New York at MoMA. And of course there's the big, um, one of her big bronze spiders. It's what, 30 feet high. It's like a, you're walking, you walk in it and, uh, and under it. And uh, I snapped a picture of that and sent it to my husband. And I said, look what your mother just bought, the second spider. So, but he, he, had, he learned a lot about Louise Bourgeois. Um, yeah, we have, we are fortunate to have so many memories. Um, our, our, our children were um, seven or I, uh, maybe eight, six, five, and two when the museum opened. Um, I remember uh, when the first, all of the art left our street to go to the museum before it did, I filmed the house uh, with all the pieces hanging there because, um, there, there, our children were fortunate to remember, you know, much of that. Uh, and um, so, uh, and she continued to collect. I was going to say she filled the house at least once or twice again, from what and, I... And the museum is going to continue to get some wonderful pieces. And we're, and we're certainly, we're certainly grateful, but she, she was, she was good at telling the stories, but when and I think you've, uh, you've got that knack. Well, I don't know about that, but I, I have lived it. I mean, married to her son for 47 years. So uh, it's been, it's been uh, very special for all of us, truly. Yes. So Christina, do we have some questions from our um, members and friends? I'm, I'm going to put that question out now, if anyone okay has a question that they'd like to pose to Wynnon or Susan, I will keep an eye on the chat for a minute. If not, we'll move to concluding, but um, I know they'd welcome any questions if you have them. It's a lot to uh, take in. But it is. We are so it and Christina, what I can say is if you, if for all of you who are, uh, we'll talk about acquiring the building, that'll be good. Um, but if there are questions you all think of after today's program that you would like for us to answer, please free, feel free to email us and we will be happy to share those answers. So um, when an Andrea uh, Rowanskikin is asking about the building, about the how the build, purchase of the building came about. Yeah, well, first, Andrea, oh, Billy loved you. Uh, and you, she valued the years that you served as a trustee on the board. And she was so appreciative of the times that you emceed 
so many occasions. So, so thanks for participating today. Um, you know, it's so interesting because of course, Wally, the Holiday Corporation is in real estate. So uh, 81 uh, or 82 uh, was really a good time for a buyer. Uh, um, the uh, Wally, they, they, a few things came up, uh, uh, but as soon as they saw the old Masonic um, Temple Lodge, uh, they they loved the proximity to the White House. You know, we weren't going to be on the mall, but it was a great look. It was a great location. But then, of course, you probably also know. I'm, I hate to be repeating maybe things that you just know, but it was a horrible part of town. Right where we are now, this wonderful place uh, was not a a um, not a safe. It was drugs and. Uh, prostitutes and two and a half blocks from the White House. Uh, but uh, we, uh, I, I feel very grateful that I think, you know, they had not only the vision for this museum, but to transform a turnaround part of this city. And uh, we've received many, many awards for that. But I don't remember it. I mean, it was, um, it was a, it was an easy purchase. It wasn't an expensive purchase, which was fortunate uh, for, for, what, for what they got. And um, Susan, you do know uh, the, the story with the bargaining of the, um, was it the, well, talk about not, not a great, good location. The, uh, the- uh, You mean the, the Casser wing? The Casser Wing was yeah. a porno parlor. Porno parlor. So I mean, just look what we've done for women. Like, gotten the men out of the uh, Masonic Temple, and you know, gotten the bad people out of the porno shop, and you know, yeah, pretty amazing. And I, I think what I remember most is Mrs. Holiday saying how there were rats in the building, and she just couldn't see it. And Mr. Holiday said, "No, no." It has great bones. There's so much we can do with this. And she said, luckily, she wanted to flee from the building, but saner heads prevailed. Yeah. We have a few other questions here. Um, so uh, Jan asks, did Mrs. Holiday start out working at the Chinese embassy? Perhaps you've covered this already, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right when they were um, first married and they were in Washington, um, she, of course, I did not know her then, um, but um, uh, that was, I think, in 45, 46. Yeah, and Jan, we didn't cover that because we're, we mostly were talking about the art today, but yep, she did have some interesting stories to tell about working for the, the her dragon mistress. And um, I encourage everyone who's looking for more information and, and a deeper biography to check out the NIMWA website. We have wonderful archival materials and exhibition and videos that I think you'll all find very um, enjoyable and help you remember all the wonderful things that, that we can appreciate Mrs. Holiday for. So I am going to thank you all for attending and thank you so much Winnen and Susan for a wonderful presentation and I hope everyone will uh, find more. We're gonna end this evening. We're just going to play some video um, to round out the evening. You can sign off when you wish, but hopefully um, you'll enjoy the video. And um, any questions here that we've missed, we will endeavor to get answers to you. So thank you so much everyone for 
joining us tonight. And again, thank from our family. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all for participating. So it's great to coming. be with you from the museum. <laughs>
I heard you first got this idea some 20 years ago. Where did the idea first start? Well, we were attempting to do research on uh, a woman artist that we discovered her works in some of the great museums in Europe, and we knew nothing about her in spite of having studied history of art. And when we consulted the source books and texts that were available, we discovered that no woman was mentioned in them. This was in the early 60s, and we decided that perhaps a suitable focus for our collection and our efforts would be to show the contribution of women to the history of art. What kinds of exhibitions do you hope to attract there to your museum? Well, we're very proud of the opening one, which is American Women Artists, 1830 to 1930. Nothing is of significance has ever been done on this subject. And the catalog is, is wonderfully scholarly. It's, it'll be uh, the definitive work on the subject, I believe. And then we have many other exciting invita in exhibitions planned for the future. Yeah, there so, are satellite groups around the United States, right? Yes, we have uh, one large gallery devoted to state exhibitions. The first is an exhibition from Kansas. They were the first to apply, but many other states have now applied. And we're establishing committees in every state so that the museum can be really national in scope. And it's our hope that people everywhere can identify with it. I'm sure you've read the one criticism, a concern, I guess, uh, stated by some, that by having a separate museum that you actually give these women artists a, a status that is unequal to men. Give me your response to that kind of criticism. Well, there are various reasons for separatism. Separatism exists now, of course, to a degree. But... Um, this is separatism in celebration of achievement and in honor of uh, what women have accomplished. And they've accomplished a great deal in the arts, not only in the fine arts, but from a humanistic point of view as patrons, et cetera, and collectors. But um, I also think there is an argument for specialty museums, uh, particularly when a great deal of research still has to be done. And uh, in our advanced study center, we'll be doing biographical research, catalog uh, resumes. Um, I think there's great validity in providing a fertile environment for those who want to work in a given aspect of art. Well, it sounds to me like it can only have a, a positive impact on the future for women artists. It is called the National Museum of Women and the Arts. It is only a few blocks from the White House. We wish you the very best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.